online community and you guys here in the room. It's so good to see you. Uh, I wanted to take just a couple moments uh, and just acknowledge that though this week is Memorial Day, I wanted to pause and take a second to uh, remember and to thank those that have sacrificed their lives for our freedoms here in our country. And so it's such a such an honor and a, and a privilege to be able to be here in the room with you guys and worshiping in person. And so why don't you guys go ahead and stand up. We're going to be singing a song called Yes and Amen. And this song reminds us of God's promises, that what God says he will do. God is not a promise breaker. He's a promise keeper. And so as we celebrate and worship this morning, let's keep that in mind. Welcome to Gateway this, this morning, everybody. Hope you guys have a good one.
take me back to the dark. Lead me back to the moment I heard your voice. Take me back to the music. Lead me back to the moment I saw your face. And it was all so simple. It was easy.
grateful that the distance between us has been solved, that you have done the work for us to bridge the gap of our relationship, that we can be close, that you are close. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We just ask for a better understanding of that love and that sacrifice that you've given for us and making it possible to be a friend of God. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for singing with us, y'all. You may be seated. And before John comes up here, we do have one more thing for you. A little special song. If you're still waiting, then the world will change. Keep on waiting. Then the world will change. One day our generation is going to rule the population. So we keep on waiting. For every dollar that is given at Gateway, we are making a difference, life by life. Together, we help meet the needs of our city, from meals and financial support to community and friendship. Displaced people and refugees are cared for and provided guidance as they establish their new life in a new place. We help the most vulnerable people in our community by providing access to organic produce and groceries. Through strategic partnerships with international organizations, we holistically meet the emotional, physical, educational, and spiritual needs of some of the resource-poor communities 
around the world. We bring life and freedom to children, teenagers, families, couples, singles, college students, and young adults through serving teams, networks, community groups, life groups, and recovery groups. Through our local campuses and our online campus, we create a space for people to belong, serve, grow, and heal. Through what we give together, lives are impacted, communities are transformed, and our world is changed. Yeah, and isn't that cool? You don't have to wait for the world to change because as a part of this community, God is using us to change the world life by life. And that, that was God's intention, that the church together would work to see the world change life by life by life. Speaking of life, you ever play the game of life when you're growing up? That board game, it's kind of like Monopoly. Um, and, and you go around the board and, and you learn about life in relationship to, you know, money and, and kind of what happens. Like you go around and, and maybe you'll land on college and you can decide if you're going to go to college, it'll delay earnings, but you might end up making more every time you go around the board. And every time you go around, you have paydays and you have to pay taxes every time around. You might choose to buy a house. That house might get termites or have a fire. And so you learn about insurance. Did you have insurance or not? You may land on have kids. That'll cost you a pretty penny. You learn about these kinds of things, but it's worth it, right? And then, you know, you might land on uh, one that says crisis or windfall. Maybe you land on one of the blocks that midlife crisis. You don't even get a Corvette or a mustache. You have to start over in your career. That's it. And then you might land on one that says car accident. And if you'll pay 15 grand if you're uninsured. Another one says tax refund, collect $75,000. Ever gotten that tax refund? I sure have. <laughs> one, one round, it'll say the stock market's up. And if you hold shares of stock, you get to collect extra money on payday. The next round, stock market's down. Kaboom, you have to pay more, give more back. And it's just like life. It teaches you about life and relationship to money. You know, life goes up and down, their crises, their windfalls, money comes and money goes. And have you ever played board games where people lose perspective? Like sometimes people just get so into it, right? I mean, they just get angry, you know, and they, they like they're ruining friendships and you go like, it's just a game. It doesn't really matter, you know, whether you win or lose according to Hasbro, right? It's how you play the game. You know, it, it, it's how you and your friends bond or how you end friendships. <laughs> That's what matters most. Well, you know, believe it or not, Jesus told us the same about the game of life that we're in right now. Jesus said this, Luke 16, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. And then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. In other words, in the game of life, you know, money comes, money goes. There are times of great prosperity and great challenge. Along the way, you'll have to make decisions about earning and spending and saving and giving. We've been talking about that in this series, how we've got to be wise about how we live in this world and all that. But when it all goes back in the box and you and I go back to God, who did we become? That's what really matters most. That's what matters most to God in the end. Now, let me just say this up front. If you're here just exploring faith, you're new to faith, I want you to hear something very clearly. You know, you don't earn relationship with God. Doesn't matter what you do financially, doesn't matter uh, what you do service wise, God's love for you is unconditional. God is a giver, and He gave us this free gift of relationship and forgiveness of all our sins through Christ. You don't have to earn that. But God does care about who we as his children grow up to be. He wants us to grow so that our hearts are more like his. And God at the, at the core is a giver. God so loved the world he gave. 
And so we're going to talk about how God actually has us living in two economies. We all know the world's economy, but there's another economy, a new economy that Jesus said is, is here and is coming. It's God's economy. He talks about it in Luke 16. Take a look. Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you haven't been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? True riches. What are true riches? Hmm. If you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, meaning when like all our plastic pieces go back in the box, who will give you property of your own? Something that lasts. And then he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We talked about this week one, how it's a test of our hearts. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and they were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. And this is what we've been focusing on in this series, that we all want more money and there's nothing wrong with more, but what God is looking at first is more heart. Is that that money really is first a heart issue? And we talked about this week one. And that Jesus is saying, really, the way we handle our money is a test of our of our hearts. How are our hearts growing to be more like God? And that's what Jesus is indicating in the game of life. You know, worldly wealth comes and goes. But there is a real life that goes beyond the 70-year game. And, and in the end, it's how we used all that we had to play this game of life that counts for us forever. So this morning, I want to talk about a new way to play the game of life, the one we're in right now. Because one way is with fear-based economics. It's a scarcity mentality. It's what most know well. Um, you know, they're... It's all up to me. There's not enough. I need more. What matters is how much I can keep. The scarcity economics. And the problem is it leads to extreme fear and worry and anxiety and discontentment. But there's another way to play if Jesus is telling the truth. It's in God's economics, which is based on God's abundance, not our scarcity. But that requires faith or trust is another word for faith. It's counterintuitive to our fear-based economics. So Jesus taught this abundance economics. He says this, give, if you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more and running over, overflow. Whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used to measure what is given back to you. In other words, it requires believing that God has an abundance there is enough. God cares about me. He doesn't want to take from me or hurt me. God is a giver, and I can't outgive God. That's the general principle of, of this new economics. Now, it does require trusting God more and more. So what I want to do today is walk through our heart's motivation for giving anything, and I want to encourage you to just locate where am I right now and where do I want to be, and then just stretch your heart, stretch your faith, and see, like we've been talking about, if you actually don't like it more, if you don't feel more truly rich in every way, not just money, but all the things you're hoping money will, will give you. All right, so let's walk through this. Level one, giving is quid pro quo. It's like the base motivation to give anything. You're going to get something of equal value back in return. So I play indoor soccer, you know, and we have to pay our season dues every season or we don't play right but it's okay because we want to play and we know they have to provide facilities and referees and websites and and all that so it's pay to play that's quid pro quo now quid pro quo giving actually doesn't engage the heart at all okay because it's you're just getting something back for what you give a guy actually um asked me once he said i don't get it like and and he was sincere he said why does the church depend on willing contributions of good-hearted people. Why don't you just create a business model? And he starts walking through it with me. You know, he was like, you know, like, like people pay cover charges to hear music this good all the time. And, and, and you guys don't charge anything. And, and people pay $500 for a weekend of training and the kind of life skills and relational skills you guys teach and that you can, 
You can get in your restore groups and other groups, uh, and, and you offer it free. People pay 150 bucks an hour for a counselor, and you can sit down and, and talk with a pastor or with others or, or get in, in groups. Kids developmental opportunities, he said. I mean, people pay boatloads to develop their kids. You guys are developing people's kids every week here. And singles, how many singles have probably met their spouse here? I mean, dating services are a gold mine. You could call it gateway. Yeah. So that's quid pro quo. And, and God actually directs his church to do otherwise because God wants his church actually to model this abundance economy. Jesus said, freely you receive, freely give. So if, if guilt or getting back something are your main motivation to, to give anything, stretch your heart to a new level. You know, try to stretch to a new level because otherwise I don't think you'll ever feel truly wealthy as we've been talking about the whys of that. All right, level two, it stretches our heart more. It's need-based giving. That's the next motivation. People hear uh, of a need, it motivates them to give, and that's good. That's a good motivation. I mean, the heart that gives to meet needs has grown larger than the heart that gives just to get a tax break or, or just to get something back. You know, I, I was amazed when we did uh, our One Life celebration when we, when we built this building here at North. There was a woman who stood up and said, I'm not a Christ follower, although I think I now believe in God. She said, but, but I'm giving toward this building because I see what good this church is doing to help people. And it feels good to be a part of something like this, and I realize there's a need. And that was amazing to me. You know, but, but I think that's, that's a part of it. You know, people see all the good we're doing together here to serve people, and then they see there's a need, and they feel compelled to give, and that's good. It's a good motivation. You know, Peter Drucker, who was a, a business consultant the last century, really, he wrote 40 books on business and organization. And uh, I had some time with him near the end of his life because he devoted the last years to helping church leaders. And here's what he said, uh, the why. He said, nothing much is working in this world anymore. There are very few things that truly transform people's lives. Really just a couple of things. Local churches, 12-step programs, and a few nonprofit agencies. So I'm going to devote the last years of my life toward getting behind the kinds of churches and nonprofits that transform lives. To do anything other than that would be sheer folly. So giving to meet needs is good. And if that's where your faith is, I would encourage you, ask God to show me more needs and give to honor him, meeting more and more needs. It's a good motivation to stretch your heart. But there's a higher motivation still. This is giving that gets more at the heart of it. And quite honestly, this is where God's economics start to play. So level three is giving to trust and for faithfulness to God. So we, we talked about this, this the last week, but Jesus tells a parable um, in Matthew 25. I'd encourage you to go read it. I'm going to retell it, kind of paraphrase it in, in light of what we've been talking about and this parable that Jesus gives. So imagine this. Imagine I'm a wealthy entrepreneur. Okay, and I've, I've got multiple businesses. I have to go on a long business trip. I'm going to be gone for quite a while. And so I decide to entrust three people with my various businesses. I give them the, 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 the businesses based on their ability. All right. And the first business I get, I, I give to Susie to run. It, it produces $50,000 a month. Okay. And I ask her, send $5,000 a month to my wife. All right, I want to provide for it. And, and so I tell Susie, you can do whatever you want with the other 45000 a month. You know, you can choose to reinvest it in the business. You can spend it. You're free. And that's pretty generous of me, right? <laughs> to send 10% to my wife, and then you, can, you make the decision of what you want to do with the 90%. And I, I make the same deal with Pete. I give Pete my 20000 a month business, ask him to send 2000 a month uh, to care for my wife. And then Joe, I give him my 10,000 a month business to run and ask him to send a thousand a month uh, to my wife. And then he can do whatever he wants with the 9,000. So I'm gone, but I, but I check in, you know, I'm keeping up with my wife. I love my wife. I want her to be provided for. I want her to flourish. And so I call and, and she updates me and she tells me, Susie has been sending 5,000 every month. I'm like, awesome. That's what I asked her to do. 
And she said, Pete started with 2000 a month, but it kept growing. And now he sends 4000 a month. I'm like, wow. I mean, I didn't even ask him to do that. Somehow he has multiplied the business and, and, and he's, he's giving my wife even more. That's awesome. And then he said, she said, Joe sent a thousand the first month, 500 the second, but he's been sending nothing ever since. All right. So what would you do? What do you think I would do? We all know, right? You're going to take what you couldn't trust from Joe and give it to Pete who was super faithful, right? I mean, somehow uh, did more than you asked with what he was given. So don't miss how true to life this actually is because the bride of Christ, it says in scripture, is his church. It says in 2 Corinthians 11, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. And if you read in the book of Revelation, it says Jesus and his bride, the church, are gonna be made one. There's a wedding. They're brought together as one. Jesus loves his church and all her imperfections. And Jesus said in Matthew 25, I'm going away, you know, but I'm coming back. And while I'm gone, you know, be wise with what I've entrusted you. Take care of my bride. And that's personal to him. And the parable of the talents reminds us that it's also of great benefit to us to be faithful because there's great reward. So in Matthew 25, Jesus says, the first servant reported, like in his parable, to the king, Master, I invested your money and I made 10 times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You're a good servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted you. So you will be a governor of 10 cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and I made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You'll be governor of five cities. Here's what Jesus is saying. This life is a test of faithfulness. And the rewards are great. I mean, God's, God's made that clear. He's a rewarder. So in week one, we, we, we talked about the test that God gives us to see, are we loving money and trusting money first or, or God first? And we, we read the passage where he says, you know, if you claim to love me, God says, and demonstrated by honoring me first, take the first tithe or 10% that I've given and redirect it to my house, to the storehouse, which is in the local temple, or in our case, you know, the local church that functions as his body, as his bride, and to meet the spiritual and physical needs of people of the world. And as we saw in the last couple of weeks, this is the only place in scripture God says, and test me, because he knows this is hard for us. He knows that. He says, test me and see if even where it doesn't seem possible, if I don't resupply and make a way and you don't feel more blessed than you could have imagined. Now, as we've been saying, this is not God lotto, okay? This is not give to give. This is not prosperity gospel. This is give to love and be faithful. It's a relationship. And money is just a, 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 a game piece on the board that you can choose to use to love God and, and people. And, you know, week, week one, I, I told you, now I know, you know, my motives can be questioned and all this talking about this. I said, you know, I, every time I talk about it, I hear stories of how faithful God's been and people who have tested him. Uh, and, and I said, you won't believe me if we produce something. So why don't you guys just take out your phone and record if you've tested God, what have, have the results been for you? And then we'll just show them. And we've been showing you along the way. So watch a few more. We, we can't even show you all of them. We've had to edit them down. Uh, but watch what some more that you sent. And then one we did produce, uh, Carrie's story. Carrie is one of the volunteer uh, financial um, consultants that, uh, that does the workshops here that, that we put on, that she puts on for you. So watch this. Hi, I'm Jess, and this is my wife, Carrie Lee. When we first got married, we felt like it's important to be obedient and give 10% of our income. Uh, even, at the, even at the time, I wasn't making very much. Carely, uh, I was still in college. I just graduated, and we had about $80,000 in debt. Uh, but through that time, uh, we were able to get out of debt in about four years, and I averaged more than a 10% annual salary increase over the first 15 years of my career, and we really felt like that was God's confirmation that we were doing the right thing. We started the tithing. And I got a promotion that I thought would never happen. When we started tithing, I started getting raises when they told me that wasn't possible. 
So I just want to encourage um, all of you that are thinking about tithing. It, is, it might happen in ways you, it probably will happen in ways you can't even imagine how God will provide for your needs, but um, he just, it's, these miracles just drop for me personally. Um, so I think it'll be the same for you if you really um, take a leap of faith and trust him um, with your resources or 10% of it. Um, he will give you everything you need and more. Hopefully this helps you. I remember when I graduated from college and I had debt and just the physical weight of that debt um, on my shoulders. I got a second job and really traded off debt like from a 16% credit card to a 0% and I would play that game every six months until I paid off all of my debt. I just was not going to be beholden to the credit card companies. And all through my career, I spent 22 years in a software company. Um, and I got a little lost in the allure of corporate money. All the while, God was tugging on my heart and calling me into financial coaching. I denied it, <laughs> kind of gave God the Heisman on that part of my life. Um, honestly, because I was seduced by the comfort and security that a high salary brought. I thought that success was money. Money became part of my identity. And I really felt God stripping that away, um, that people loved me for who I was instead of what I could bring them or give them. And uh, about four years ago, I had to just quit um, without any kind of job lined up. I had some savings, but I just felt like God was calling me to something. And I was ready to surrender to what his calling on my life is versus my idea. And that's when I kind of started living in God's economy and really understanding that he'll always provide. And so throughout this time, I got certified as a Dave Ramsey uh, financial coach. I also got certified as a creative life coach. And since the beginning of 2020, have been doing that essentially full time to serve people. It's really powerful um, what community has done, not only for my life, but in the lives around me. Um, being a part of a life group where I felt seen and known and loved and celebrated for exactly who I am has taught me that essentially how God sees me. I didn't know that I was wrapped up in what society told me. And being in a community of faith-centered friends has been everything to me. They're my family. That's what we've been talking about is how God promises that when we put him first and we're faithful to him, he is faithful to bless us in ways we couldn't even imagine. And that's not just financial. It is like you're talking about there, but also like you're talking about it's with things that sometimes we think money is going to get us, but it can't, like contentment and security and value and worth and a sense of purpose. You know, those are the things, the spiritual blessings that God wants to provide even more. But you don't tithe to get. You don't tithe to earn God's love. You do it to love God and to trust him, to be faithful to him. You know, Jesus told some religious leaders who were tithing, but not out of hearts of love for God. They were trying to prove how good they were to people around them. And he said this, you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. All right, so don't miss this. Jesus says first, you should tithe, yes, do it, but not to prove yourself or out of guilt, but actually out of love for God. And because you want to partner with God to bring justice and hope and mercy to a hurting world. And I told you, you know, uh, Kathy and I have been doing this uh, for decades and we have seen God be faithful. And, you know, you can't outgive God. That's what I've seen. Now, again, I know me talking about this, my motives can be questioned. And so I want to talk about that for a second. First of all, I want you to know 
I make not a penny more or less, no matter what you do or don't give to this church. My salary is fixed. It's set by a volunteer board of directors. I have to make decisions just like you do uh, about giving. And sometimes it, it stretches me, but tithing is never, uh, it's never been a problem. Even though, like I told you, with two kids on a $38,000 a year salary, and I'm always amazed how God is faithful. But my motives in talking about this are to help you to see God is faithful to what he says. He is. But to, to live in his economy and see it, we have to trust first. And my motives also are to keep the, the great things that you guys are all doing together here as a church going more and growing more. Both those motivate me. And that's why I've been challenging you. You know, if you're not there yet uh, of tithing, stretch your faith, stretch your heart. Test God for three months. Do it. Tithe 10% and see if you're not glad you did. And if you don't trust our church, find another church. Give it all there. And, 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 and then watch if God isn't faithful. And then get involved in the church you're going to trust. Because Jesus loves his church. It's his bride. He loves her and all her imperfections. And, and he wants us to be a part of what he's doing through the church to be a force to change the world life by life. So when you do that, and then you start to see how faithful God is, don't stop, keep going. So the final level of giving is investment giving and making a giving plan. And quite honestly, this is where giving gets really fun because you become like God's investment banker. The more you invest in his kingdom enterprises, the more you find funnels your way to be able to invest in and be faithful with even more. And just think about it. Jesus said some really crazy things, didn't he? I mean, he said stuff like this. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal and internet hackers cannot get to it. Yeah, you gotta worry about stuff like that. And, and like we looked at in Luke 16, he said, whoever can be trusted with the little can tr be trusted with much. Whoever's dishonest with little will be dishonest with much. If you've not been faithful in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Now, what if he's telling the truth? That God doesn't want to take from you. Actually, God wants you to help, wants you to gain more than you've ever imagined. But, but here's the thing. You can save in the world's economy, right? And you should. We talked about this last week. It's wise to save. You need to. We talked about the 10, 10, 80 plan and all that. But you can also save in the new coming economy. In God's economy, one is temporary, the other's lasting savings. In other words, Jesus is giving you very good investment advice. You ever thought about it that way? Like you get investment advice stuff all the time, right? Invest in this, invest in that property, invest in stocks, invest in bonds, invest in cryptocurrency. Some is riskier than others, as we've seen in the last few weeks, right? But none of it is lasting. What if Jesus is actually giving you investment advice in something that will last? You ever thought about that? The question is, do you trust it? You know, I, I, I lived in Russia when the old communist economy collapsed. Um, I was there. And, and Russian billionaires today were funneling all the rubles they could into uh, dollars. The same thing happened in, in Venezuela uh, in the last five years. You know, the government was lying to people in 2017, saying that 10 bolivars could buy $1 of goods. Well, the truth is you had to have 3,000 bolivars to buy $1 of goods. And smart people could smell it coming, right? They're like, this isn't trustworthy. This, this old economy in Venezuela, it's going to collapse. So really wise people were keeping you know, enough to live comfortably and plowing everything they could into any lasting currency. And now, I mean, the boulevard is 2.8 million to $1. It's, it's the world's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not worth anything anymore. Jesus is actually saying the same thing to you and me. This is wise for you. It's the best investment advice you'll ever get. The only question is, do we trust it? Now, I will be honest with you. I read this, it kind of sent me panicking when I really thought hard about it, <laughs> okay? Um, and and I, read, I read this verse we're looking at today. Do not judge, you'll not be judged. 
Do not condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, Jesus says, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So the context of this is this uh, living in abundance, right? You know, don't, don't compare yourself to others. You're not judging others. You're not worried about others. You're freely forgiving because God has freely forgiven you in Christ. But then giving with whatever measure I want given back to me. Hmm. When I read that, I had to stop. And I asked, do I really believe that? And I didn't really want to think about it. <laughs> ever, ever felt that way? Why? You got you to ask yourself these questions. So in 2005, I started really wrestling with this. Uh, Kathy and I had been living by the 10, 10, 80 plan, you know, that we, we were talking about. Um, we've been faithfully tithing for decades and, and even being able to give, you know, sometimes more to different organizations and stuff. But, and I'd seen God's faithfulness, but if I keep giving more, like stretch to 15%, 20%, 30%, like, will God resupply with more so I can bless more and invest more? Is that true? And then I heard Hugh McClellan's story about a year or so after that. Hugh McClellan was the president of Prov Provident Life Insurance. And he said when he was young, um, he was, he was a, a Christian, uh, but he found that no matter how much he made, he never felt like it was enough. And then he started actually tithing uh, to, to be faithful to God and as a heart check for himself. And he said that, that put it in check. But he found God kept blessing him more and more. And so, so he eventually made a giving plan. I'd never heard about that. And he first decided how much is enough. What's enough? You ever thought about that? What's, where am I going to be content? And, and he said he determined that. And then he decided he would give a greater and greater percentage to God's work as he felt blessed more and more. And he would keep increasing the percent. And today, Hugh McClellan and his wife give away 70% of all their earnings. They've started thousands of Christian ministries for the poor and churches all around the world. So I read this and I was so incredibly challenged because if God's economy is real, if Jesus is telling the truth, this is just being really smart, right? I mean, then if I invest a greater percent, I will have more to invest, more to save for eternity, more building into people doing good here, it's more in two economies, right? If Jesus is telling the truth. And he's saying that what's to come, the real treasure and real property, it makes, you know, E-Trade e -trade commercials with bling and exotic vacations and crazy luxury lifestyles look stupid and plastic, like the little board pieces you put back in a game. But we hear Jesus' words where he says, do not be afraid. There's a reason he says that. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. What's coming? So sell your possessions and give to the poor and provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes and no moth destroys. And we hear this and we are afraid, right? We are afraid and we think God wants to take more. But what if it's just the opposite? That's not what he's actually saying here. What he's actually saying is this world's economy is going to end. In other words, digital currency is not the currency of the future. The currency of the future is trust and love for God. That's what's coming eventually. And so what are you investing in? So this really challenged me. So in 2007, Kathy and I finally sat down after two years of struggling with this, honestly, to trust, to trust more. And we wrote out a giving plan inspired by Jesus' words and by Hugh McClellan. Um, because, you know, think about it. We, we make plans for important things, right? I mean, people make retirement plans and college fund plans, vacation planning. Do you know there are 400 million websites to help you plan a great vacation? Because we're smart people. And we realize, you know, if you want a great vacation, sipping pina coladas on a beach in some white sand tropical paradise, you got a plan. You can't just like wing it and last minute hope for the best. You'll be driving to Galveston. You'll be very disappointed, right? 
So we plan for things that are important. What about a giving plan, an investment plan? Well, that's what we were wrestling through. So we finally, we finally did. So 2007, uh, I'm a, I'm a pastor, which again, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to share this and I've been very hesitant to, and I've prayed a lot about it. Cause I know, you know, Jesus says, give your, don't talk about your giving, um, you know, do it in secret. Uh, and, and that's not my heart in this King David, King David did talk about his to inspire others. Hugh McClellan inspired me. That's the only reason I'm talking about this. I want to inspire you not to look at me, look at God. And look at how faithful God is to what he promises. So in 2007, I'm a pastor with two kids, a fixed salary, college is still ahead. I wasn't making much more inflation adjusted than I had made coming out of college. Okay. And um, we had tithed. We'd done the, our, the 10, 10, 80 plan where we're tied 10%, saved 10%. And we had done that for decades. So we had saved up about three years salary uh, in savings. And so Kathy and I first decided how much is enough. And we wrote down that number. We put this, I put this in my journal. And then we made a giving goal. We, we said, God, if you allow it, here's how much we want to give in our lifetime. So a lifetime giving goal. And quite honestly, it was ridiculous. Like there was no way. It was impossible unless God got involved. It was, the amount was 13 times my salary at that time. Um, and I didn't have, I wasn't an author. I'd written one book and it hadn't done well. That was it. And, you know, like I said, I have a fixed salary that the board of directors sets. So impossible goal. But we told the Lord, we'll give a greater and greater percent as you keep resupplying. I tied my salary to the church and then anything, wherever or however it comes in above that, we'll keep giving a greater and greater percent. And did I mention it was 2007 when we started this giving plan? Anybody know what happened in 2008? Four years of the worst recession ever. So it's not like it doesn't test us and stretch us because the way God's economy works is you go first, you trust first, and then you see him resupply. So we started doing this. And I got to tell you, it was ridiculous, hilarious, because we kept giving more and God kept surprising us. It would come in from places that, I mean, we, we didn't know and, and we weren't expecting. So four years into this, we were giving 30, the equivalent of 30% of my salary when I started. Six years later, 50%. Every year, TurboTax would warn me I'm, I'm an audit risk. So just a warning, you might get audited because I gave too much. We gave too much. But God would always surprise us. How? I mean, book writing, investing, we crazy things. We found unclaimed property, like worth a lot. We had no idea we had other crazy things that would happen. In 2015, I wrote Imagine Heaven. It went to number one on Amazon. I can't make that happen. None of my books have done anything close to that. And for several years, we were able to give more and above my salary. And, and, and again, we didn't have the means to do this, but it was crazy what God was doing and crazier still. In 2008, we set a lifetime giving goal and we're already having to set another one. God is, you can't out give God. Now, remember, I did, we did not have the means to do this when we set the plan in place. And that's the scary trusting part about it. But Jesus said it, give, and it will be given to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And I only tell you that because God is real. And God is a giver, and you can't outgive him. And by the way, you know, the fun part has been God has shown us all kinds of needs all around the world that we've been able to invest in. But honestly, most of it we've given here to this church because, you know, and above and beyond, because I can see firsthand how much good you guys all together, what we're mobilized to do all over our city and, and all around the world and how many lives are changing through this church. So I just want to encourage you, start living in God's new economy. And if you only have faith to stretch, to start giving, to meet needs, ask God to show you needs and watch how fun it is to start to meet those needs. If you have faith to tithe, you know, 
stretch. Faithfully start to do it for three months and see if God doesn't make a way where you thought there was no way and you're not glad you did. And if you have faith to set a giving plan, do it and start and see if you're not surprised at how fun it is to partner with God and what he's doing in the world with what lasts for eternity. Let's pray together. God, that verse we all know, we don't really think about it much. You so love the world, you gave. You so loved every single person listening to this. You gave everything. You gave your own son. So that relationship with you, life with you is a free gift. And you tell us freely we receive, freely give. Not to take from us, not to take away from us. You, you provide, you want us to enjoy, you want us to provide for our families. You don't want us hurting at all. You want us to feel truly wealthy in every way, as we've been talking about. And that doesn't just come from money. It comes from those spiritual qualities of blessing and contentment, security, value, worth, purpose, meaning, things that money can't give. And so, Lord, we want to be people who trust you more, whose hearts grow more and more like yours so that we can be people that change the world life by life. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing out together. I will rest. I will rest. I confidence. So where does that leave us? Well, right now, uh, there's so many of us here in this room, and we're all coming from different backgrounds and different stages of our spiritual journey. Well, if you're new here, whether you're, if you're online or here in the room, we want to let you know that we are a church that loves everyone life by life. And part of that is getting involved. And on the screen, you'll see a link for gatewaychurch.com slash thrive. And we would love it if you are online and you're, this is your first time maybe watching us or joining us online to fill out the very first box that you see when you go to that link. Then you guys here in the room, if this is your first time here, then head out into the courtyard and go to our new here booth. We have a gift for you. We'd love to connect with you and share with you a little bit more about this awesome community. 
part of our community, though, we've also partnered with so many organizations uh, that have a global impact and a local impact here in Austin. And as we're talking about giving, I just want to let you guys know that you guys are part of a very generous community. So if you give here at Gateway, thank you so much for your gifts. Thank you for being obedient to what God has, show, has showed us in Scripture and trusting in Him. But, you know, maybe you're just checking out uh, our church or maybe you're just checking out faith and, and exploring it or maybe coming back to faith or wherever you're at on your spiritual journey. Please don't feel pressured to give uh, because it's actually just something that we do uh, in response to what God has done for us. And we actually, uh, I wanted to share with you guys that talking about uh, finances a little bit, we're changing the way that we're giving in order to maximize our impact with our dollars. We changed our giving platform in order to save on credit card fees in order to, to make those things a little bit more effective, right? And so on the screen, you will see a number and instructions on how to give with our new system. And once again, no pressure if you're brand new here. There's no pressure at all. And then on your way out, you can also give physically. But a couple of things that I want to uh, get you guys cued in for what's coming up here at Gateway. Next Sunday, we're going to be uh, going to our new uh, COVID protocols, which will be a mask optional service for both of our services, and registration will not be required anymore. That's both for kids and for here and adults. If you have any questions at all about that, you can go on our website, and we have a video there that explains everything about that. Also, next Sunday, uh, we're going to be celebrating our high school and college graduates. Uh, we have several that are here. Actually, Caitlin, or I don't know where she went, she graduated this weekend. And so we're so excited to celebrate with them next Sunday in the courtyard. So here at North, stick around for a little bit uh, and, and uh, you know, cheer them on as they go on to new and greater things. Next week, we're starting a new series called Trust Me If You Can. I don't know about you guys, but I've struggled with trust issues in my life. And so as we go into this, we know that having trust issues uh, can actually lead to difficulty in relationships. So we're going to embrace that tension, and we're going to learn about what it means to trust. Can't wait to see you guys next week. North family, you guys are dismissed. You can leave any of our four exits, and we'll see you guys next Sunday.